Welcome to our podcast. This is Friends on Fire. I'm Mike. I'm a lifelong devotee of financial independence. I even wrote a book about it. And I'm Maggie, a newer convert, but just as passionate, especially on the intersection of minimalism and financial independence. We're one in the same. We are two like-minded friends who believe that talking about money with your friends and family opens the door to financial well-being. The Friends on Fire podcast is about dispelling myths, building financial acumen, and sharing your financial independence journey with the people you care about. This is Friends on Fire. Hey, Maggie. Hey, Mike. How's it going? <sighs> that you really good, want huh? to know? It's been a rough day. Yeah? I can't even say day. My voice is like cracking. Well, I figured it was rough because you had to postpone this recording session like nine like four times. times. Yeah. I just had something come up now, too. And I was like barking at my family. I was like, I cannot move this again. <laughs> I was like, it's just rude at this point. Like how many times I've I mean, I have a legitimate reason, which is there is a lice outbreak in my home, which I returned home from vacation to get told about by some uh, friends and family and uh checked right when we got home didn't see anything and i have i have some lice combs because we had this like four or five years ago and then i checked again yesterday after school and i was like oh no Mm. and then when my other two kids got home i checked them and right away i was like this isn't just like a i'm not i'm not sure i was like i can i can see them in the comb and like you know, there's a mix of nits and like actual lice. Like I know what they look like. So we had to make an appointment. So this is what's interesting here. There's a point related to this that is related to finances. Uh, Price is right on how much it costs us to get treated. Ooh. We went to, Three I'll name the company. I'll name the company. We went to the lice ladies in Atlanta. <laughs> Great name. I'm not familiar with their pricing. Great name. There's one head. right, there's one in Dunwoody right by you. Um, I went, We went to them before many years ago. You can try to treat lice at home. It's very difficult to thoroughly eradicate. Mm -hmm. And I'm a bit, I was telling the lice ladies this day, I was like, I'm a big DIY person. I like to do things myself to save money and just to do them because I can. Lice is one thing I will not mess with. And I would like rather pay somebody else to definitely eradicate it and give me a warranty and like, all this stuff. Anyways, yeah. I'm going to say 150 per kid. So the their whole the way they charge first off is like <laughs> buy individual lice. Buy individual <laughs> if you know kind of <laughs> buy individual and there's like a starting price if you have it. Yeah. And then if it's like if you have really long thick hair, which one of my kids has, one of my kids hit the max price that they charge, which is that one kid cost two fifty. Wow, just so much hair and it's so thick, and there was a lot going on in there, and sh- and so, but if but if you just get checked, like they checked Greg, he had nothing because a lot of guys frequently don't get it with shorter hair. He had nothing. There's no charge for him because if someone in your family is treated and it's just a check and they don't find anything, then it's free. Hmm. But they found something in all my kids, which I knew because I had found something at home. And then in me, I didn't think I had anything because Greg had kind of checked me, but he didn't really know how to as well as I do, perhaps. Um, they barely found anything in me, but enough that it was that they had to like charge me as if they yeah. did, you know, because at that point they've gone through your entire head. My head's itching just talking about this. By the way. <laughs> um, anyway, OK, it was six hundred and fifty dollars wow. for the five of us. And that, and Greg had no charge, so it was just for the four of us. And then we got to go back. Three three of the kids, not me. I don't have enough to need to be retreated. Three of the kids have to go back for like a checkup and retreat next week, and that's going to be another like hundred and seventy bucks. That's uh, that's very expensive. Like close to a grand. Uh, what's going on? There's a little kid crawling behind you. So normally I would say this is a scam, but. It's legit. That's actually a good segue to today's topic, Mike, because I hate to even admit this, but at one point while one of my kids is getting treated, she actually says to the lady, we're having like a really nice discussion with the two ladies that are treating. They're just really like we're there for hours. So we mm-hmm. feel like we you know, got to know them. Um, She says she goes, you know, what would be a really good business plan? 
is to just leave like one egg in my hair so that I have to come back and and you can charge me again. And and we're all she and I'm looking at her. I'm like, that's a terrible that's called fraud, first off. And even the lady is like, that would be a terrible way to run my business. You know, like it's like we all gave her a lesson in business and we explained uh, she now knows what white collar crime is. She now knows how important like word of mouth marketing is and how you can't run a business with unscrupulous business practices because people will eventually find. Well, we were like, it's unethical. People will eventually find out. And by the end of it, she was like, I get it. That was a terrible idea. I was just being silly. And I was like, OK. So today we're going to be talking about real scams, not lice ladies, which is a legit business. And legit we've, business. we've been there to the, so the one near us. It, the one near. And, and by the way, I. I highly re- it's a little bit more expensive with uh that I word. You know what the I word is? No. Inflation? Oh, inflation. I think their rates, I mean their rates I feel like are up also. It was not that expensive last time. But back to the whole like financial lesson in this. Some things are worth paying a professional to do and and personal decision for everyone, but in my case lice is cuz they handle it efficiently and effectively. And they sit there like and my kids don't complain when someone else is going through their hair for two hours in like a very tedious and sometimes painful way. Um, And they sit there and explain to my kids all the things they should and shouldn't do to avoid this in the future. And they listen to them. They listen to professionals in a way that they will not listen to sit down and listen to their parents. Yeah. So as much as it's a, you know, annoying thing, we plan for stuff like that. And uh you know, it's just been a, a, a not fun 24 hours as a result. Hey, but let's talk about real scams. Yes. And this is something that I'm I, I'm actually surprised we haven't talked about this in what now? Three years of doing this we podcast. Talk, we talked about like identity theft. We talked about it maybe a little bit. Yeah, you're right. At a very high level. And uh, regular listeners of the show might know that I everything that I think is not totally above board, I refer to as a scam. And yeah. so th- there you is, use that word quite loosely. So I think all kinds of like tricky marketing is a scam. And we're going to be touching on a little bit of that. So scams are everywhere and have been forever. And we're not just talking about, you know, Bernie Madoff type scale of swindlers. We're talking about everything, stuff you see on Instagram to emails you get to things you see when you're out and about town and in the fact that like social media has made it so that anybody can get directly in touch with you has just made this ecosystem explode and so we're going to be talking about types of scams and but basically how to recognize them and avoid them that is the most important part here the best way to approach this maggie i think is to start with why do you say maggie like you're like talking to me to avoid scams (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm totally just kidding yeah like i'm talking to it's you like you threw you my name in there like, I, well, like maggie i know you've fallen for a lot of scams in your life so let me, yeah no make i sure I, I thought that like addressing <laughs> you by name is how humans I know, I interact kidding. with I each know, other I know, I know. all right the best way to start this off is to talk about guiding principles that you should remember because you don't have to remember like every single type of scam If you understand the principles behind them, you will recognize all of them and then some. So the first one is that if this were such a great deal, the person who invented it would keep it a secret and they would make a trillion dollars. Yeah, (laughs) they would not share it with you. Right. I think number two is like, if it were such a unique opportunity, why would they come to you (laughs) or somebody with A large amount of, not that you don't have a large amount, you know what I mean? But if it's some sort of like you can, you know, quadruple your money, why do they want someone that's going to, you know, quadruple $1,000 when they could find somebody who would, you know. Right. They wouldn't be contacting you on Instagram for this great idea. They'd be going to some huge investment bank and making a trillion dollars on it. Yes. All right. Third guiding principle. If you don't understand why it's a good investment, then there is a pretty good chance that it's not. And you should trust your gut on this. You don't have to be a financial expert to just see through some of the murky details behind some of these ideas. I don't know if this is a fourth principle or not, Mike, but but just to wrap all these up, good investment opportunities usually do not come to you via unsolicited people that you have never met before. Mm -hmm. Right. They're vetted in some way by just someone vetted that, you know, you have a 
I don't know. I, I don't even want to assume that, but it just feels like it's a, a common uh, theme there also. <laughs> so as you say that though, Maggie, all, all of our advice is unsolicited. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> But but we're not selling you anything. That's true. Except some like $3 Etsy templates, yeah, which our, are not as good. Our advice is to like not spend your money and invest it for the long term. It's pretty low risk. Yes. So let's talk about some red flags. And these actually came from an email from Schwab that you forwarded, Mike. And I know you're like a big Schwab fan. Love Schwab. That's Charles Schwab for those who are not on a single name basis. And so we'll run through these that came in the email, but then expand on them because some of these were helpful, but some of them were, I think, a little more specific to people who are probably the Charles Schwab demographic. So the first one is guaranteed high investment returns, supposedly with little or no risk and sounding too good to be true. And these are verbatim, so I don't want to take credit for their work. Uh, Second one, unlicensed or unregistered sellers. Use Investor.gov to check out the background of anyone offering an investment or in securities. Number three, skyrocketing account values. Investments that appear to rapidly increase in value are often fake. Fourth, fake testimonials. Scammers often pay people to provide fake reviews, so never rely solely on testimonials to make an investment decision. On that note, if you could pause this podcast and leave us an Apple review, (laughs) we would really appreciate it. But that's a real, that's a real testimonial, you know, or if you don't like us, leave us a fake testimonial about how much you love us. And number five, the last one on this list from Charles Schwab, fake contacts. Take caution if someone approaches you through social media with investment opportunity, pretending to be a friend or having a mutual acquaintance is, is a common tactic used to gain trust. And we'll talk more about that one in a minute as we get into some actual uh, specifics to be aware of, because that that's a more and more common one. So let's go through some of our own list of scams. The first one you are super passionate about, Maggie. Passionately angry about, as you would say. Multi-level marketing. Oh my God, you love yeah. talking about I think MLM the pr- plans. The, um, if you really want like a series on multi-level marketing plans, you should listen to some of the Price of Avocado Toast episodes. That's the, that's the name of a podcast, by the way. We can put a link in the show notes. I am not an expert on MLM uh, schemes, as many people call them. Or MLM marketing, multi-level marketing, um, but they're in the category of scams for a reason. I mean, technically they are legal businesses, but it is a scam in the sense that you have to like, I don't even know if they, I think they have to disclose it somewhere, but like somewhere in the fine print, they talk about how like 99% of their, you know, quote, employees, people who are, you know, who sign up for the, uh, to be sellers don't make any money and actually lose money. And like, yes, there are a few people at the very top. That's how a pyramid scheme works. The few people at the top are making money off all the people below them. Mm -hmm. But the average person doing an MLM program, we would call it a scam. Yeah. Because they're not going to get everything. They're going to be promised a lot of things that are not delivered, no matter how hard they work and how much product they pre-buy and all the other promises. So on the spectrum of what we would call a scam, this one is an actual business that exists, but it is built on misleading the people who participate and taking advantage of them. It is not a fair practice. So another one that is low on the spectrum because it's actual, it's an actual legitimate business and it's legal is there are a lot of times that you are are signing up for things and doing things. And I'm going to give an example with employee 401k programs. Many of the providers, which could be like T. Rowe Price or Fidelity or others, when you're signing up for your 401k, they offer like a do-it-yourself investing option where you can choose your own investments or they offer to manage service. And they're not always super upfront that like that managed service has a fee associated with it. It's kind of unclear. And what I would categorize this is like unclear instructions where they're just kind of marketing big words to you and they're not being really upfront about the cost and they're not really educating you about. And again, that's not a scam technically. Um, I, I don't know what the I would call it a scam. Is it? I, Tr- yeah, tricky I would call marketing it a scam. and pricing. Yeah, is. tricky marketing. Yeah, you're right. We know better, which is why we would call it a scam. Um, but but I've talked to people before who are doing that and they don't even realize they're getting charged the extra 1% or whatever it is. 
for basically like robo investing. There's not even like a real person that's, you know, actively managing it. And so just be when you're signing up for things and you don't realize what you're even committing to, um, that is a uh, just an, another one to be aware of. And again, it's on the spectrum. So, I mean, we're kind of going to get worse on the spectrum. Now, on the very far end of the spectrum is a Ponzi scheme. This is what Bertie Madoff ran. And you would be hard pressed to actually find a Ponzi scheme to participate in. I believe they typically These target days. high net worth individuals. But it's basically somebody taking your money, reporting out their own results and telling you you made 100 percent in a month. And if you decide to withdraw some money, they are taking money from somebody else's contribution and giving it back to you. There actually is no investment going on. So they take money and then pay it back to all these other people and themselves. And it has to perpetuate in order to be sustained. And they're they're producing fake statements mm-hmm. telling you that you made a return of, you know, one hundred thousand dollars and hoping you'll never actually try to pull it out because yeah. if everybody pulled it out. The thing falls over. Yeah, that's right. Or they get investigated and taken down, which is what often happens. But at that point, your money is all gone. There is no that we'll we'll talk about FDIC insurance and some other things later, but that's not protecting you in the case of something like that. And it's just gone. That's the Bag Lady Papers book that I've talked about. It was someone who lost her entire life savings in the Bernie Madoff scheme. We'll put a link in the show notes to it because it is a great book on many levels. Another one is anytime you see an account that some guaranteed high yield plan or high rate of return that's outside of like a Schwab or a Fidelity, if there's some company that's offering you 20% return on your cash, that is a scam. Because again, going back to one of our guiding principles, if somebody could make 20% on their cash, they wouldn't be telling you about it. They'd be doing it themselves and they would be filthy rich. They would not need you to participate. So if something is way over what you're seeing in the market, you know, like two, three percent high yield interest rates. If you're somebody's offering you more than that, chances are it's fake. I'll hit a couple more new cryptocurrencies and maybe all cryptocurrencies, but specifically <laughs> new cryptocurrencies are. I'm feeling like all crypto is a scam right now. Yeah, given I, how much I think money it's all I've a lost. scam. Um, but new cryptocurrencies, the ones that kind of pop up, um, you know, kind of like meme currencies. And ones that are endorsed by celebrities are definitely a scam. And it's called pump and dump. Maggie, do you know what pump and dump means? It reminds me of breastfeeding (laughs) when I would drink alcohol. And it is called pump and dump. And you had to like dump all your breast milk. It was very sad. Well, you had to waste that, good breast milk. Yes, that is, that is one <laughs> accurate no, description of pump and dump. I do not, not know what pump and dump is. close to what it means in, in this context. I have no idea what it is in this context. So celebrities will endorse this cryptocurrency and they may be given like $10 million worth of it. They tell all their followers to buy it. People buy it. The price goes way up. The celebrities sell their $10 million for $100 million. Then the price of the cryptocurrency crashes and everybody loses all their money. But the people who created the currency and the celebrities who endorsed it made a ton of money. That's pumping up. Weren't a lot of people arguing that like Elon Musk and some other oh, yeah, people yeah. have done yeah. some like versions of this? He Definitely. In plain yeah. sight. Yeah. It's sad to see people with so much money doing things like that. Well, it's sad to see anybody doing things like that, particularly. And then the other scam I would highlight is penny stocks or any stock that somebody's telling you is about to explode. Again, if there was some stock that was about to explode, some investment firm would buy 100% of it and not tell you about it. There is no reason why a real investment would come to you for this type of opportunity. So just ignore it. But hey, what about when if you like, I know you sign up for Motley Fool. um, I don't anymore. Oh, but but when you did Mm -hmm. and you were getting kind of tips on different things like Yep. Those are their best predictions and thoughts. It's not a scam, right? It's That's a little bit different. So that's a it's a good point. So Motley Fool is a stock picker service and they have a whole bunch of stuff. And I got really excited about it because I had a couple really big wins, like 1500% increases on a couple stocks. And now the difference is they were doing actual research and they actually believe in it and they don't have a vested interest in the performance of the stock themselves other than their reputation as a stock picker. The reason that I stopped though is that it was all built on a lot of hype and there was certainly some fundamental truth behind everything they were picking. It wasn't a sustained investment and everything crashed. Now luckily I got out of 
everything that I had invested in and I made quite a bit of money and got out before the crash. So I feel very fortunate that I didn't like lose a lot, but I no longer pick based on their recommendations just because it was just, it was too much hype, not enough fundamentals. I'm going back to kind of lower returns, but more clearly understandable returns, which is 0.3 on our key principles. This is why I invest in index stocks. So I don't have to think about any of that. (laughs) Okay. Another scam is anyone asking you for your account number or to send money or for your credit card number. And this could happen via social media, which we'll talk about in a minute. This could happen via phones. Uh, Sorry, I say phones, via a phone call. Um, This could happen from an email. A really common one right now is that you'll get a call on your cell phone where it'll say like, it is like a robotic voice I was going to try to imitate, but it's like, this is Amazon. Is that good? Uh, <laughs> we have, we are processing a eight, it's always a really big amount. We are processing an $813 charge on your credit card for your recent order. Please call us to confirm. I usually hang up at that point, so I don't even know what they say, but they're trying to get me to call back this number or mm-hmm. hit something to connect or I don't know what. And then they're going to like ask me for my credit card to confirm of like, well, was that actually charged on my card? Now I've given them my credit card number and or they're going to ask me for bank account information or something else. It's going to turn into a scam. All those calls are scams. And those calls are really targeting like senior citizens and people that just aren't aren't as uh, scrupulous to ask questions and kind of put up their spidey sense, which is what we're trying to encourage all of you to do in this episode is just assume We'll talk about it more, but assume that that is fake, right? Amazon does not call you. None of these credit card companies call you in that way. You can always call them back. We'll talk about this more, but that that is a very, very common one that is happening a lot more lately. And chances are these calls that you get or emails are being done offshore because it is hard for the U.S. to regulate behavior in countries which we do not control, as you can imagine. Okay, last one in terms of a again, a very common scam lately is that somebody on Instagram who you think is your friend, like like literally is someone you think you follow. And I'll clarify what I mean by think you follow all of a sudden reaches out to you and, and asks you for money, ask you for personal information, tries to get you to buy some product that they're pushing. And what's crazy about this lately is it's often a fake account that is created to mimic another account. So this happens, uh, we, we, um, actually we're interviewing Liz gets loaded this week. Um, she and many other people, once you, especially once you get a bigger following, um, someone creates an account and her account is Liz, Liz gets loaded. Someone will create an account that's like Liz dot gets loaded or Liz gets loaded with two O's. Something where it looks really similar. They, they mimic everything about it. They mimic her profile page. They mimic all her past posts. And she's tagged us before. So I'll sometimes get actually get like re get the notification that we've been tagged by this fake account. And they start contacting all of her followers. And remember, your followers are public information on Instagram. Anybody could go in and see who's following you. So these bots go and create these duplicate fake accounts with very similar looking names. And if you look, if you look at it very quickly, you think it's Liz and you think like, oh, I've been following Liz for three years and she gives great advice and she's never asked me for anything. And now she's got this great opportunity where if I just send her $50, she'll get me into the ground floor of this new investment she's doing. And don't ever trust it. I see so many, particularly like personal finance influencers posting about all the fake accounts that are mimicking them and saying like, I will never ask you for money. Not in this, you know, not, especially not through a DM, right? It would be like an actual program that they're selling on their website that's legitimate. And um, and so th- this is a big one to really keep an eye out for on social media. Do we have any fake accounts yet? No, here's the thing, Mike. <laughs> I feel like you really know it, like you've made it when yeah. somebody wants to fake your account. Nobody has tried to fake our account yet, which I'm kind of like thankful for because it's a hassle. You got to like report them and get all your followers to report them. It's just, it takes a little while with Instagram to get them taken down. But I'm also like, you know some of the best and brightest get copied. Like, what, how come no one's trying to copy our account? I think they know that our listeners are too shrewd. You're right. Yeah, I think that's They're it. not going to mess with us. 
don't mess with Mike and Maggie. I think we've just invited scammers. To yeah, mess I think we with did too. Now. So let's move on to some stuff that isn't necessarily a scam, but important to keep in mind and our recommendation to stay away from. I personally think it is a bad idea to invest with anybody who comes to you with some sort of proposal to invest in their business. Along the same lines of our guiding principle, like if it was such a winning idea, a bank would be all over this. They wouldn't need to come to you. So if somebody's coming to you, it is typically higher risk. But I have friends pretty frequently forward me proposals that are like, hey, I got this real estate investment deal. I got this investment deal for some, you know, cannabis farm in Canada. Can you evaluate it? It's like all of this stuff and it requires them to put $50,000 towards this business. And I look through it and I'm like, I guess it's it's okay, but it's risky. And you would make more money if you just put your money in the stock market without the risk. And you wouldn't need to wait the five or 10 years to then pull your money out of this business if the business was still around. And so you can look at it. It's interesting, but typically if you have a friend or some friend of a friend who's coming to you with some business opportunity, you should just skip it because you're probably better off just investing in the stock market or real estate yourself. Yeah, I think you also have to be careful. I mean, I'm not saying you should never invest with friends, but like I would say with many things and like I've said with crypto, you know, be willing to lose that money and be willing. Don't if you're going to be sour with that friendship and it's important to you if that business doesn't do well, which many legitimate great ideas don't do well. Tons of businesses fail and it's not an ethical thing, right? It's just it didn't do well. If that's going to put you out financially or emotionally, don't even get into it in the first place. I feel like this is a challenge to me to get you to invest in some business idea of mine. I, I want oh, to try yours. to come up with something. You got. You would trust money, me, right? Mike. Oh, yeah, I would. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to need to see the details. Okay, because I, can't look I at want it to invest in a cannabis farm in Canada. Are you interested? I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> you had me in. at cannabis. <laughs> Another one along those same lines would be putting your money with people or companies where it's not instantly available. So if you invest in the stock market with your Charles Schwab account, you sell it. It's available immediately within a second. If you give your money to some friend of yours who in, who's investing in real estate in Canada or whatever, you might not be able to access that for five or 10 years or ever. So if there is illiquidity in the nature of this investment, you should probably stay away from it because if things go south, you will not have the time or the ability to pull it out at all. The next two are ones that Maggie, I think you and I disagree on. I would advise people to stay away from. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts. Cryptocurrencies and NFTs. You think they're I, I, an no, okay I love idea? No, no, no. I love that you're so short and sweet that you were like that. You were done. Like I would advise people to stay away from them. Uh, I'm going to say a lot more. That's not going to say much more, but just a lot of words. Um, yeah, I'm. You know, we, you and I have discussed this a lot recently, Mike. I am still. I'm not even pro them, to be clear. I'm not buying. I'm not putting any more money into them. I already have some money in crypto, and I'm letting it hold. Mainly because I'm kind of curious, not because I believe it's really going to rebound, but I'm just on the fence on this one. I'm I'm not super educated on it, so I'm not an expert by any means. Um, we did do an episode on it if people want to listen to it and just get a little more educated in the space. But I, I'm just kind of like in the middle. I'm like, I really don't know, but I would put it at the same category as investing with your friends. If you're not, if you can't afford to lose that money, if you want to play around with it and you're curious and you want to learn more about it and you can afford to lose that amount of money go for it. Um, but I, I know how you feel. That's just not a good idea. I'm a little bit more like, eh, it depends, you know, I'm, I'm all right. Not, not, it depends more. I, I don't yet know, feel confident making that statement, but it's also in its infancy. There's no history. I, I feel it. I used to not be sure about the stock market. So I'm a late adopter mm -hmm. in many of these areas. <laughs> and these are both in their infancy there's not a lot of history. There's been, you know, it's been incredibly volatile. Um, back to the, your like celebrity pump and dump examples. There, you know, there's been a lot of like kind of shady things happening at different times um, and just not necessarily rational behavior. And I just don't know. So I'm not putting, I'm not messing around with them right now. 
you're not putting anything more in, but you're not taking Though it out. No, I did get an NFT for my birthday for my brother, which I thought was like a super cool gift. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. We don't really exchange gifts too. So it was like bonus gift. Very fun. Well, it it's a fair evaluation. They are in their infancy. I would say that if you go back to our guiding principle number three, if you don't understand why it's a good investment, then you probably shouldn't do it. And this is different than if you were to invest in like Amazon. You understand how Amazon makes money. You understand why they're growing. I don't think anybody could explain why crypto or NFT is a good investment. So we will we will leave that one on the spectrum of not a scam, maybe not a good idea. My advice would be just leave them alone and do something that's more predictable and less risky. Yeah, yeah I, would, I totally agree with that. Now, this brings us to one interesting point. It's kind of related is FDIC. And we've gotten some questions about this before. But FDIC is Federal Deposit Insurance Company. And this does not protect you from scams. It protects the balance of your account up to, I think it's $250,000. I didn't put that in per the depositor, notes. Per depositor. Oh, it is in the issue. notes. Okay. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of other yeah. kind of rules about it you can Google. And so what this means is that in an FDIC-insured account, then $250,000 is protected. If you take the money out of your account and go buy crypto on Coinbase and then Coinbase goes bankrupt and you lose your money, that's not FDIC-insured. Yeah, I, th- I think the theme here is that like there's no... There's nothing that will protect you from all these scams, right? FDIC insurance doesn't cover this stuff. Um, Your credit cards will protect you on some fraudulent charges. Mm -hmm. Um, Not $250,000, though, probably. So, Um, and you know, but a lot of these, a lot of these scams are getting like directly into your bank account. Mm -hmm. And if you if you give somebody your withdrawal information and they take money out of your account. You can't, that's not what FDIC insurance covers, right? Yeah. It's covering if something happens with like insolvency with the bank. Right. And this is a result of the Great Depression. I, I, I don't know if this is actually true. This is what I remember it being. So as a result of the Great Depression and ev- there was a run on the banks and banks went bankrupt because they could, didn't have all the cash on hand, the government started insuring amounts of cash for each account in the case that something like that happened. So if you give your information out and somebody steals $100,000 from you from some overseas scam, that's not what this is. Yeah. Um, Mike, you were dead on, by the way. FDIC is an agency created in 1933 during the depths of Great Depression to protect bank depositors and ensure a level of trust in the American banking system. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and we did talk in, in a couple of our credit monitoring episodes, we did talk about some of the credit monitoring companies. Some of those companies will protect you from some scams. They have some kind of you know insurance that protects you from certain things, but but not a lot of the types of things we've just talked about, mm-hmm. right? And so one of the things that I just think is important to remember, like as we shift into some tips to avoid these scams, is remember there's really not a lot of protection against them other than your own behavior, learning them, being able to spot them and avoid them. And so, you know, that's why, why we're focusing on this and really wanting to, you know, just kind of educate people and give you a reminder to like, always keep your spidey sense up. So, so let's, uh, speaking of spidey sense, which is a very technical term. (laughs) Yeah. It's a financial term. I learned about it. It's a financial term. Yeah. So let's do some specific tips to avoid scams. And we will run through these and hopefully you're aware of some of these. But again, let's go back to guiding principles. If you understand what you were looking for, then a lot of these tips are going to come naturally. Now, first one, don't trust anybody. By the way, Mike, this one reminds me of your rule of like, when we talk about buying stuff and lifestyle inflation of nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. Don't trust anybody. I'm going to make my, this is going to be I your shirt. <laughs> nobody cares and don't trust anybody. Hi, I'm Mike. Want to be my friend? Uh, I like it. I love it. I love it. All right. Number two, Maggie. Uh, number two is C number one. It's that important. Don't trust anyone. Right. It's on the shirt. Wow. I'm, I'm like only half joking. Right. Well, I'll skip to number three. Number three, if you are not a hundred percent clear how this person or company is making money, then you should just skip it and move on. Because there's a, like multi-level marketing is a great example on that and, mm-hmm. and many other scams, but just move on, right? Yeah. It's not your job to understand something that someone's pitching you. Just move on, invest your money in index funds. This whole get rich quick scheme, it's a, there's no way, I don't want to say no way, there's no way for the average person to get rich quick. 
Yeah. Right. So if it, if something's really pitching rare. something like that, just move on. The next two items are kind of related. The first one is going to be turn on two factor authentication on your financial accounts and really all your accounts, honestly. And many places are going to start requiring this. I'll give you a really good example on that one. Um, and I actually got this from Liz Gets Loaded in uh, one of her podcasts recently on like Venmo and PayPal. And I think on Venmo, you have to go in and do an extra step. Anybody could pick. There's a scam now where people like ask to take a picture, or ask to make a phone call, offer to take a picture, or ask to make a phone call on your phone. And within like a second, they can open your Venmo that you think that they're making a phone call or something. They or even pretending to take a picture of you. They open your Venmo and they send themselves money. You can't get that back. No way to get it back. And that's a good example. So if you have two-factor authentication turned on on Venmo and on PayPal, which you can do in the apps, it doesn't require, sorry, and an additional password too. It avoids somebody from being able to do that because they would have to retype in your password, which they wouldn't know. And then speaking of passwords, use strong ones. Like if you're using Chrome, for instance, and you create an account, it will make a recommendation which would be like a 20 digit, all kinds of like crazy numerical things. Uh, Use those and then don't repeat them. Write them down. Keep it somewhere safe. Do you speaking of like write them down, be careful where you write them down. But do you use a password management tool? No. Uh, I know I got you hooked on Evernote. Mm -hmm. It is more valuable to me than what I pay for Evernote. We use one password, our whole family. Mm -hmm. And it is the most amazing. I'll put a link in the show notes to it. And we, we won't go into detail on this, but it connects to Chrome. There's an app on your phone. Like I've it just, tried this and I didn't see how it was all that great. I think I was I, just not using it correctly. I'll have to like give you the full okay. lowdown on it because right. it truly is amazing. Well, you convinced me of a number of things like this. So we, I we believe might need you. to do an entire episode on that. All right, I'm down. It is, it's just, it's like one of those things that is just a pleasure in the day to day i use it you know 20 times a day in the ease it adds to it just makes things easier in my life and i love it and and way more secure also and then also if something were to happen to me it's way easier for like a family member to access my passwords and get to my uh, accounts and stuff like that okay uh the next one is just talked about that when we were kind of giving an example of scams where a lot of companies will like call you and they're they're going to connect you to someone or even give you a number to call back. Don't do that. Like go look up if, if it says it's Amazon, which Amazon doesn't call people, by the way, you can barely get an agent on the phone if you want to. They do everything via chat and email. If, it, if it's your credit card company claiming to call you, hang up. Say, oh, thanks. Cool. I'll call you back directly. Go to the Chase website, go to your Chase app, look up the proper 800. Don't use the number somebody gave you to call back. Go find the proper number to Chase, call them and say, hey, is there a problem on my account? Did somebody, yeah. you know, and and I, most of the time there will not be because it's a scam. Um, and so if anyone claims, calls you from a company, especially like, you know, a big reputable company where you can go look up the number, hang up. Call them back via via the proper phone number that you found on their website. Yeah, that's a great tip. The next one is going to be to freeze your credit. We did a whole episode on this, episode 48. Basically, I used the analogy in that episode that credit monitoring is like leaving your front door open, but having a security camera at the front door to see who's there and enters your door. Freezing your credit is like building a wall around your house so that nobody can uh, I was get gonna in. Say a, I was going to say a deadbolt, but I like the wall too. <laughs> well, you, you could it's take, more like you could a take wall. it in multiple directions. It's more like a wall because a deadbolt, they could still come in through the window <laughs> and it provides a full wall around all of your yeah. uh, anything that requires credit. So identity theft, people stealing your credit, opening up accounts and taking money out in your name. Freeze your credit. It won't happen. And just to be clear, it's free to freeze your credit. So yeah. you should, everybody should go do it like now. Drop what you're doing, go leave us a review and then freeze your credit. You know what, Maggie? Going back to your tip about unclear instructions, all of the credit agencies now have their subscription services that they charge oh, you yeah. like a monthly fee to participate yeah. for. You don't need any of that stuff. It's a rip off. You yeah. can freeze your credit without participating. Yeah. It is free. Don't do it. But you might end up down a path on their site that implies you do need to pay to freeze your credit. And you don't. Not true. Yeah. You, you need to like go back and Google. We give links in our in, our, in the show notes to episode 48. 
which we'll put in the show notes of this episode, but you can easily go find the links on how to freeze your credit for free. I, just want, I, I love this tip. If you are unsure about something, like someone calls you about something, you get an email and you're like, I don't know, this sounds legitimate. Call somebody else that you trust and explain what's happening. Get a second, third, fourth opinion. My mom every now and then asks me about something. I'm like, mom, glad you asked me. Like, nope, delete that email. Let me explain. You know, like I'm like, nope, don't do that. Don't do this. Um, and send, so, us a, send us a DM on Instagram yeah, and we'll tell you don't trust anybody. Yeah, don't trust anyone. Um, but but seriously, go ask someone else. Half the time in you, if it really is kind of like a, a you know, out there wild scam, you even trying to re-explain it to another person, mm-hmm. as you're saying it, you might be like, wait a minute, this sounds pretty fishy. Um, and so I'll always get like a second, third, fourth opinion before acting. There's no rush on any of this stuff. Yeah. And by the way, if there is a rush, and someone's like, you have to commit now or like uh, while I'm on the phone. That's a huge, huge. We didn't. We should have yeah, put that. It's a sales flag. tactic. Huge sales tactic and huge red flag to like get the F out of there. Yeah. Now, the last tip also applies to just economies in general. When it comes to money, assume that everybody is working in their best interest, not yours. Everybody wants to make money for themselves and there are varying degrees of how much they want to take advantage of you. And this goes from just tricky marketing to outright fraud. But if you have that assumption in mind as you go into evaluating what's coming across your plate, you're going to make much better decisions. All right, Maggie, you ready for top three takeaways? Oh, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. I mean, I'm still ready, but you should go first. Okay. Number one, if it were such a great deal. The person who invented it would keep it a secret and make a trillion dollars. Billion. Oh, no, trillions more. (laughs) Okay, number two. Scams, fraud, counterfeit, etc. are as old as economies themselves, global, and they are not going away. So be cautious. They are out there. There are entire companies set up to defraud all of us. It's very sad, but it's a real existence. And number three. If you don't understand why it's a good investment, it's a pretty good chance it's not. And you should trust yourself. Give yourself a little bit of credit here. And uh, I'm not going to just like 3B. If you just don't trust yourself, like we said, get a second, third, fourth (laughs) opinion of somebody you do trust. Are we going to like bring this full circle and tie this back to lice? I think that you have a way to do that. I don't know how you would. I have no idea what it is. We should just jump into the end and wrap things up. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you've been challenged or inspired by what you've heard, please rate and review the show. You can also subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. If you have any thoughts or questions, we always love to hear from you, including your uh, concerns about potential scams. You can always leave us a voicemail or text us at 404-981-3370, or you can hit us up on Instagram. All right. Thanks, Maggie. Good luck with the lice. (laughs) Thanks. Okay. Bye, Mike. Bye.